Well, well, Willard, thank you for coming on the show today. I'm so excited to have you. I really have just completely been blown away by your artwork. And for everybody out there that doesn't know how I got to his artwork, um, I was at the, let's see, what was it? It was uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not in Orlando exactly almost a year to this day last year. And I came across his exhibit and I was completely blown away because you literally have to look through a microscope to see the work. And it is so detailed. I'm just blown away. I had to talk to him. I think he's going to be a great story and a great inspiration for you guys. Welcome to the show, Leonard. How are you doing today? Oh, it's a pleasure to be on your show. It really is. I, always, I enjoy talking about my world because, you know, I, I always believe that the little world should be introduced to the big world sometimes. <laughs> you know, we disregard things because we can't see. Right. Humanity has a habit of only believing it unless they see it. You know, it's, it's like uh, the word nothing. There's, there's no such thing as nothing. There's always something. So sure. Nothing does exist. You know, sure. There's always something. So um, my work is, 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 is a message to people. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I began from the day I was born because we all begin small, small. So to me, that is the beginning. That is the beginning. Um, sometimes in life, you know, we seem to forget where we come from and how small we really was. Sometimes we just seem to have a habit of thinking, you know, that everything is the same size. Sometimes you, humanity believes that, you know, you know, the word, oh, that's bigger. Oh, that's better. Oh, yeah, that's bigger. You know, you know, if we, if I say spend a little time, you know, a, a big time, you know, but sometimes the smallest things can have the biggest impact. They do. They truly do. In life, in life, you can say everything and mean nothing and say a few words and mean everything. You know, so my work is, is a, uh, like I said, it's a message. It, it, it's a, uh, it's an introduction to how people should think. Because if I, if I have a qualification, or sorry, if somebody has a qualification and I don't have a qualification, or this person here doesn't have a qualification, they automatically feel that they don't have anything because they don't have a qualification. But that isn't the case, because I know the best can come from less. You know, it's like a, a, a diamond in a dustbin, you know what I mean? Sure. If, if a diamond's in there, people think, no, oh, there's nothing in there. How do you know? How do you know there's not a diamond in that trash bin, as you'd say in America? How do you know that? How do you know that? You know, because I always take time to look and listen and understand, and I don't underestimate. Uh, because of my um, autism, I've learned to. <laughs> I've learned to listen. And. I understand that everything on this earth is here for a reason. You know? If you see an ant, an ant is here for a reason. Ants, insects are here for a reason. Without insects, we'd be dead. Bees pollinate. Insects, they're part of our survival. You know, so I live in that little world. Um, that's why I create sculptures that can't be seen. But you can see them through microscope. And when people do see them, it blows their mind. 
their minds get completely blown away. The Queen of England said to me when she saw my work, she says, I've never seen something so small that meant so much. Thank you for the gift. That was when I made a crown for the Queen, a coronation crown, which is perched on the head of a pin, made in 2024 Carol. You know, that was a great feeling to know that something was all meant so much. Woman has my work in her in her private studies in Buckingham Palace. Can anything get bigger than that from something small? Yeah. <laughs> It's amazing. I mean, just to be able to, to take the patience to make something so microscopic, what does that entitle you to do? I know you even had to make some tools for yourself to, to do this. Take me through the process on how you got to go through to make a piece of art. Well, do you want to know the beginning? Yeah, well, absolutely. Well, well, it, it all started 1962 when I was five years old. You know, I was born to make this because when I was five years old, I was a fool and I was uh, introduced as failure because I couldn't spell. You know, in the UK, you know, if you couldn't read or write in the 60s, they would, they would humiliate you theatrically. You know, it would, it would be so humiliating that you'd turn into a leaf in a cul-de-sac you'd be blowing around in circles because you'd been, you're, you're in a, a, a quicksand of despair. You've been humiliated so much. My teacher told me that I was a consequence of failure. And she said, this is what happens if you don't listen to the teacher, you become Willard. So I was an exhibit of failure because I couldn't spell. But at the time, autism wasn't diagnosed at the time. People didn't know what it was. So I was... You know, I, I, I lost me. I, I couldn't find me anywhere. I was lost because my body was at school, my mind wasn't. So when I was told that, the only thing I could do is to get away. You see, my left leg, my right leg was out of school and my left leg was in. So I wasn't really, all of you wasn't in school. So I wanted to get both legs and my body out. So when the opportunity came, I used to run away from school quite regularly because school, they never welcomed me because I couldn't read properly. So I was not welcome. So when I ran away from school, I found tranquility. And now I discovered what I had. I didn't live too far from the school, so I didn't have to run that far. I remember running and I saw this little field and a and, a pond, and then I sat by the pond looking into the water. And it was quite nice because I was looking at all the, the little dragonflies flying around. They used to look like little brooches flying around. They used to think, oh, wow, it looks like a brooch. I didn't think a brooch could fly. You know what I mean? You know, that's... Yeah. Uh, as a kid, I, I had to create my own imagination. On, you know, whatever I... Seeing, I would almost believe, you know, it sort of... I remember seeing a beetle walk across the floor and I picked the beetle up and I started to sing to it because I thought, because of the pop group, the Beatles, I thought they said that because Beatles could sing. You know, and I used to... That was what I thought, but my, my creative mind started to develop so I carried on running away. I climbed over the fence where I lived and I, I hid in the shed. And, you know, my mother used to work part time. I remember the one particular moment, time she wasn't at home. And I came out and I started playing around, you know, and then I had a dog and my dog came running towards me to play. And he had a ball. I bounced the ball. He went over next door neighbor's fence and he started digging. <laughs> And he disturbed an ant's nest and all the ants came out of the ground, lots of ants. And I felt a little bit sad because I kept thinking all the ants had nowhere to move the ants were all this. And I, I, I wanted to see if I could help the ants. So I started building little houses for ants. I took a little 
razor blade, you know, and I started like similar to this, but it was a razor blade, and I started slicing up little bits of wood. And then I constructed and built a whole village for ants. I even made a, a, a little palace for the queen ant out of a leaf, which I twisted, you know, and I got bits of fibers out of my shirt and tied it around and cut out little arch windows. And like sitting around a palace, you know, it was like all turrets and you know, little, little windows. And, and then I started making the ants furniture, tables and chairs, little beds carousels and uh, I started to believe that ants were uh, important part of me because I get to see the ants was going to like me and they were going to talk to me. I was picking them when I used to talk to them. Say, hello little aunties, hello, hello aunties. Put them by my ear, see if I could hear their little voices. You know, and I used to think, oh, they're very happy. I said, let's see if I can see a smile on their face. You know, I used to look them really close and, you know, and I thought they were smiling. I thought they were talking to me, and, you know. <laughs> and then what happened? I heard the bell ring, school bell ring, all the kids came home. You know, my mother came home. My mother caught me hiding. But at the time, one of the next door neighbor's kids has already seen me before my mom, you see. And she looked over the fence and she seen what I'd done. And she went, oh, wow, that's amazing. That's the bestest, wow. And I heard amazing, that's the best. So I've now been told I'm good at something, you see, I've been told that. And I could hear her say, mom, mom, come and have a look at this. And her mom came and looked at this. And her mom went, oh, wow, amazing. And then my mom seen it, my mom, told me up, uh, you know, for running away from school. But when she seen what I'd made, she was like, <sighs> she gasped and said, this is amazing. That's absolutely, how do you do that? And I told her that and she said, if you make them smaller, your name will get bigger. So I think the letters in my name would get I didn't know what she meant. But she said that the whole, the whole world will know when you make little things. So if you keep making small things. So every time I showed people something, they would like, <gasps> you know, I got a toothpick and I carved all the Beatrix Potter characters on a toothpick. And I would show all the kids and the kids would be like, that's amazing. That's fantastic. That's brilliant. Sometimes they'd give me money so I could have I'd say, no, you're not looking. Here's threepence. Here's five pence. Here's six sixpence. And I was like, my pocket was full of these <laughs> coins. <laughs> I'd give it them back, you know, sometimes because they used to use that money to buy sweets. You guys call it candy. We call it sweets. So. Sure. So, you know, that's, that, that's how it all started. And, and, you know, my, my, my reputation uh, started to grow because everybody was talking about me making these small sculptures. So from the beginning, from age five, it, it, just, it, it just went on a journey and I just kept on. Every time I made something, my mother would say, it's not small enough. It's not small enough. And I say, well, what, why? She says, it's not small enough. So I started this Away. I never thought it was any good because I didn't think it was small enough. I, I, I knew it was good, but I didn't think it was small enough. So as I, as I, as I got older, I got greater. And I got to the stage where I could show my mom something. I know what you'd say? Mm -hmm. What's she say? Too big. My, mom's, my mother's from Jamaica, you see. That's smart enough. So I would never ever be able to please my mom, but I know why she said it. Because the result is what I am today. You see, um, my world was going to become a grain of sand in the sea, 
and a tidal wave is going to come from it. See what I mean? It's like a, a wasp with a small sting. It stings you and it's sort of, ow, that's how they didn't realize that could, you know, hurt so much, but yet still it's such a small sting, you know? So I wanted to uh, inf infect the world with the way like, beautiful work, <laughs> you know? And yeah. as I got older, I got greater. When I left junior school, I went on to senior school. But every time I go, every minute, every minute, in a way, every nonstop, I became possessed. I was possessed because I wanted to please my mother to see how small I could get. But I was limited because I didn't have a microscope, you see, so I was limited. But, but what I was doing at age five was doing enough to shock the world, you know, because I was creating intricate sculptures with just a little blade, and, you know. And so it became, uh, my mum was saying to me, that's all you can do. Remember, that is all you can do. So academics didn't matter to me. School life didn't matter to me. That's a friend, but because the way I was treated, it wasn't, it wasn't good for me. So, you know, I just just carried on being a, a pupil in the school. Yeah. But all the time, I had that little blade in my pocket. I was always carving stuff. You see, but I didn't show my mom anything else until I was about. <sighs> my teens. When I got to about 15, I left school at 15. Um, I left with no qualifications. I was quite glad when I left school. But I, I knew I could just get a job working in a factory, just drilling holes in bits of metal and throwing it in a container. The more holes you drill, the more money you get. It's called piecework in the UK. So I didn't care because I could I could survive. I, you know, I, I could uh, give my mother housekeeping money. I could eat. I'm alive. I had a dog. So all the little things in life I could appreciate. I didn't care. I, I just because I I lost me again because I went through that stage of finding me and then losing me again so i i would sometimes just sit in my room and, and feel sad because i kept thinking if i if i'm going to be recognized or in what i do i have to learn to read or i have to learn to write or i have to have a qualification or I have to have some kind of you know qualification sure because I kept thinking there's no way I can I can become successful if I can't read or write. So I felt sad through my teenage years. I felt sad, but then I, I was music made me happy and go out and dance and you know I met some girlfriends and they used to make me happy and we used to have a good laugh and you know. But once I get back into my room, there's a little bit of sadness there. But that sadness wasn't anything to do with my work. It was to do with the fact that I kept thinking that, you know, the doors are going to close because I can't read. You know? But even though I said that, you know what I said to myself? Well, I have a tiny key that's going to open the biggest door. I love that. <laughs> so I knew, I knew that little key was going to open the biggest door in the world. Eventually, I knew that because my mother kept telling me. She kept saying, you will be the greatest. You will be the greatest at making small things. So I, I knew then that that was going to happen, but I didn't realise how much of a titanic scale. Yeah. So 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 I knew I knew that 
something was going to emerge. You know, it's like um, I knew I was the seed to success. See, a small seed thrown into the ground, a beanstalk grew out of it. And all those, you know, the leaves, the stems from the, those, from the beanstalk would branch off into me being the successful artist that, I, that I've become. Because, you see, sometimes, you see, I can, I could be crying inside, but outside I can be laughing, you see, because I, that's how I felt, because I, you know, from, from the age of 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, you know, I was wondering where I was. But then my mother would always encourage me. And she'd say, you see, so you see, it's that little thing that you made there, one day that's going to make it big for you. But you must continue, which I did. I was always doing it. Every night, 16 hours, 14 hours a day, I was possessed. I was like, a, if, if you'd have seen me doing it, you'd think I need some kind of psychiatric help. Because <laughs> I was... Uh, <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> What's going on in this guy's head? Because, you know, I feel as though I had to defend myself with my work. You see, my teacher told me that I was no good. I couldn't get anywhere. So I wanted to get a, a qualification in revenge mm. with my work. So I, I, I knew then that something, but when I reached 21, 22, 23, you know, I was just, you know, I was in and out of work. I didn't have a job. I didn't know. I didn't really want to, to uh, I didn't know where, like I said, I was still that leaf going around in the cul-de-sac, you know? When you, have you ever seen a leaf in a corner and the wind's blowing it and it's going round and round and round? You've seen that? Well, that, that, that's, that's what I was still. But I knew one day that leaf's going to come out of there and it's going to go all over the world, you know? So I, so I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready when I was in my twenties. I wasn't ready. And then all of a sudden, time moved on, and I reached age twenty-nine. And then my mum said to me, "Show the world." So I had a second-hand microscope. You see, I bought one from the second-hand shop. Mm -hmm. And I took the microscope home and I looked through it. Because at school, a, a friend of mine took one from school to give it me illegally. It's only a small microscope, but you know, I, 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 he was a good friend of mine. He used to do stuff like that. But anyway, I bought one legitimately and I look through it and I could see things on a larger scale and I said right now I'm going to show the world now I'm going to show them now that you're going to see the seed grow into a beanstalk so what I did I found a piece of nylon and I carved an angel underneath the microscope with the wings. The wings have little feathers. I've sliced them on into the feathers. And you can see a face, everything, the whole world. But when you take it underneath the microscope, I could still see it. just a tiny bit. I could see it. And I showed my mum. I said, oh, I hope my mother's going to like this. She's going to like it. And, show her. and she went, too big. So my heart just went, whoosh. right. So I carried on and on and on and on. And then I started to develop and build a collection of work. Some of them I threw away. I kept throwing them away, some of them, which I shouldn't have done really, but I, I, I did. 
And then one day, it was as though somebody up there just touched me with a wand and said, right, time to show the world. So I, I, I went on a walk. And there's a shop in Birmingham called Palms Tools. There's a guy that used to sell all these sort of um, DIY stuff, you know, spanners and drills and wood carving tools and all types of stuff. And I went into the shop and on the, in the shop front, he had a bench. And on the bench, there was a piece of wood about this big, a piece of tree trunk. And there were wood carving tools all around it. And I walked up to him and I had a look. And I said, uh, said to him, he came over to me and said, hello, dear boy, can I help you? No, I'm just looking at it around. I said, you seem very fascinating, that piece of wood. He says, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was looking. And I says, what are you going to do with it? Oh, it's just there for show. It's no problem. And I went, let me carve something on that piece of wood. And he says, are you wood carver? I said, well, I can carve. And he says, did you have a portfolio of anything? Can I see your work? So in my copy, I had a tiny little toothpick. Peter Rabbit carved on the top. I showed it him. And he went, oh, oh my God. Like that. that but people always use that word when they see my work. <gasps> and he says, Did you really do that? I said, Yeah. I said, Look, I can. I said, the, the bigger the carving, the smaller the challenge. The smaller the carving, the bigger the challenge. I says, Let me do it and I'll bring some promotion to your shop. I'll endorse the tools. Uh, there'll be a lot of interaction going on in your shop because people will be able to see a piece of wood, you know transformed into a shape of the face of someone or something. And he says, oh, that's a good idea. He said, um, let me have a word with my wife. And he called his wife and says, look at this. His wife went, oh, that's amazing. Oh, good God almighty, amazing. I'm like, he said, that's bloody amazing. I said, thank you. Then she said, um, so he, said, he said he wants to carve something on that piece of wood. Of course he should go ahead because he's been there for a long time. I'm sick of the sight of it. Every time I walk past, I'll see this piece of wood on the table. You might as well do something with it. I don't want to see it again. Go get it. And I'm like, okay. Then he says, mm, okay. She wears the trousers. I'll, I'll, I'll listen to her. When do you want to start? And I went, when do you want me to start? I said, I'll tell you what. Put it outside. Give me the chisel and the mallet, and I'll carve something. So I went, oh, 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 oh. and I kept carving, and I carved the head of William Shakespeare. So when I did that, people came to the shop, people was looking through the window, people were saying, oh, wow, coming into the shop outside, looking at this head, this lady came over and she said, oh, is that William Shakespeare? So, yeah. Oh, how much is it? I'd like to commission it. And I said, yeah, of course you can. How much? I said, 1500 Oh, no problem. I shall write you a check. And she gave me a check, 1500 I'm like, ah, 1500 quid. Oh, my God, 1500 pounds. Oh, oh, you know, and I was really happy. So I, the first big commission, 1500 pounds. Oh. And then... There I was carving away, you know, and then all of a sudden, and one of the newspapers came and said, we'd like to do a story on you because we heard you've done the Shakespeare. And how did you start? And I said, well, this is how I started. And I showed him a toothpick. And he went, oh, wow, did the story. Then I had more inquiries. A lady used to own a big shopping center, who was the manager of the shopping center, asked me if I'd come and be artist in residence and, you know, do some wood carving and show up my work. But all that time, I never really showed them the small stuff. That came a little bit later. So I was carving big stuff, carving ballet shoes, doing carvings of people's dogs, 
carving people's faces and, uh, you know, doing restoration stuff and all. And I was earning money. I became self-employed. I had somebody who came to work with me in the shop. And, and I said to my mum, 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 look. And my mum went, too big. So I'd give my mum some money. I'd give her some money. She'd say, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I said, but I'm not happy. I'm not happy. Mm -hmm. Why are you happy? It's too big. So there I'm working away in the shop. Then I had a, a guy from a newspaper came and said, can we do a story? And how did you start? And then one of, one of the journalists says, hey, Edward and Sophie are getting married. Is it possible that you could do something to uh, commemorate the wedding? So I said, um, yeah, I can do that. So I took a match head and I carved on, on the, the bottom of the match head two people, Hedman and Sophie on the match, and I called it the perfect match. And then, boom, it went out in all the newspapers, went into the Guardian, the Independent, the Sun, the Mirror, all the top newspapers picked up on it. Then I had a call from a program called The Big Breakfast Show, and the guy called Johnny Vaughan, who was one of the hosts the show, invited me up to London, put me on the show and asked me a few questions. How did I start? And I said, well, he says, that's amazed. I said, no, that's my big stuff. Now I'm going to show you the small stuff. By then, I was doing stuff that was really microscopic, but not as good as now, because I've evolved. And I showed him the Statue of Liberty in the Eye of the Needle. And he went, oh my God. Like that. That word comes out regularly. <laughs> then, after the show, I had people come to the green room to talk to me and all types of stuff. Then he says, oh, we just had an inquiry. This guy from Jersey in the Channel Island in the UK would like to fly you to Jersey to meet you. Uh, you know, he got, I spoke to him on the phone and he says, I want to set up an exhibition with your work. Uh, would, would you like to fly to Jersey? This is Jersey, the UK. So, so he flew me over and I seen him and he says, I want to open a, a, a museum and I want to call it the Impossible Micro World. And this guy's name was Alan Debbie. And then the other guy, Russell Merridew and another chap called Mike Watts. So they put on this exhibition of my work and it won Specialist Museum of the Year. They called it Impossible Micro World. And we had all the little microscopes everywhere around the exhibition. People would pay a fee to come in. And then I was on TV. Then my name got bigger, but my mother had passed away by then. My mother died. So, um, that was a bit unfortunate. Um, but at the same time, I remember what she said. And then I became, it was the grain of sand was thrown into the sea and the tidal wave of success kept coming. And then before I knew it, I had, I was on a, a chat show called the Richard and Judy show. Um, they had me on the show and they were totally overwhelmed with what I'd done. You know, I showed them some of the work that I had the microscopes. Um, Richard told me that he felt very emotional when he saw my work. And then I had more, more inquiries for me to do commission work, for me to go to schools and talk to kids, and, you know, to, to tour the exhibition. I, and I went to Covent Garden, we did a show there, I was invited there and did a show which was very successful. A lot of people came to the show. Um, and then before I knew it, lots of people were writing into Buckingham Palace, say, talking about, because they nominate people for a, a medal called an MBE, Member of the British Empire, Services to Art. And I had a, this um, letter come through the door from a Majesty of the Queen nominating me 
to receive an award, I was honored by the queen. And I'm thinking, wow, the queen, <laughs> the queen. <laughs> 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 you know what I mean? And I went to I went to Buckingham Palace uh, to meet the Queen with a, with a, a very famous man at the time who'd taken over the management side of it. His name was David Lloyd, and I, there I was. Drove me to Buckingham Palace, and I'm looking around. I saw the red carpet. I saw all the guards. <laughs> I'm like, oh. <laughs> but through the gates, I saw Rod Stewart and I saw quite a few celebrities. And I'm now in Buckingham Palace for this microscopic work. You know, the Queen has invited me. And I'm here. And I remember talking to Rod Stewart, and Rod Stewart said, Oh, I've seen my work, mate. It works fantastic. You know, I spoke to a boxer, Ricky Atman, and a few more celebrities. But I said, oh, yeah, I saw your work on TV. You are incredible. And I'm great. I can't believe this is actually happening. I can't believe this is happening. And, um, you know, the time came for when we had to go in, 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 into the actual uh, reception area then, through to the, uh, the hall, the reception area, and into the big hall where people sit down and they nominate them, they call them out, the nominees, you know. And uh, I remember all, all I heard was uh, Richard Hatton for services to sport. Let me go there. Bell. Raj, Robert Stewart, services to music. Came okay, out. Willard Wigan, services to art. And there was Prince Charles with the medal. You know, we, had to, we had to sort of learn to this sort of bow to the crown and face Prince Charles and then bow. And he shook my hand and he gave me the medal and he says, oh, This is tremendous. I said, oh, How can anybody make something so small? This is beyond my belief. And he was shaking my hand. This is incredible. He says, You well deserve. You are an incredible artist. And I'm like, I said in my head to my school teachers, all yeah. my school teachers that told me I was nothing, I said, yeah, here I am today in Buckingham Palace. I'm now the world record holder for the smallest sculptures in the world. I'm known in the world as something that couldn't be seen. For this nothingness that I was going to become. And then I now have proven to the world that I'm now an inspiration to kids with autism, I go into the schools, talk to kids, you know, I, I, uh, I'm a member of the Autism Society, I'm a chairman for that, patron of that, and now uh, I, I, um, I do sort of, you know, corporate events with people in a room, they talk to me, I put an exhibition of my work around people, uh, people commission me, I do stuff for people, I can do self-portraits to people if they want me to miniaturize them. I can do little miniature birth signs. I can miniaturize their dogs. I can miniaturize their weddings. If they, you know, I can put them and bride and bridegroom in the eye of a needle, maybe gold. I've had so many people cry when they see what I do for them. And it gives me so much pleasure. Even though the work, I don't enjoy doing it because it drives me mad. I don't get because I've gotten better, it's got harder, but I enjoy when I finish it. Yeah. Because you know, to enjoy it because it's such a painstaking process. But it's like a nightmare when you're doing it, and it's a dream when you finish. Because you know the end result is gonna make people minds be totally blown a bit. It challenges their belief system. Like the, the, when the Queen said to me, I, I never had anything so small that meant so much. During the Diamond Jubilee, I was invited back to Buckingham Palace because um, I had a, a, a anonymous letter come through saying that, could I make a crown for the Majesty of the Queen? I said, Do you like one? Okay. 
So I made a microscopic carnation crown perched on the head of a pin. And I went to Buckingham Palace. I was invited in 2000 and I think it was 2012. 2012, around then. Anyway. And I went there, went to the gates. I couldn't see the Queen. I had a letter in my pocket. And I said, oh, no, you're not. You can't just come in here and see the Queen. And I went, I oh, know this is not the letter, but I said, Her Majesty, and I opened up showing him. Oh, <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Follow me. <laughs> and I went down to really the courtyard, into the reception area, sat down, met the Queen's secretary, and I sat there. So, Her Majesty shall be out in a minute. She's so looking forward to seeing the one you made. Came out, she's seen it, and she says, I've never had anything. She said, I'm ready to see it. And, and I went, okay, there you are. She looked through the microscope. And then she says, she went, she says something like, good heavens. She said, this is beyond one's comprehension. How can one make something so small? And I'm like, I just did. She says, thank you for this gift. She says, I shall treasure it. I've never had anything so small that has meant so much. This is amazing. And then she shook my hand and, and went, and I was like, <laughs> I'm like pinching myself. Is it real? Is this really happening to me? <laughs> so my mum was right, you know. So, and, and, and now that, that, that title that is still growing, you know, they did a documentary on the world's tiniest masterpiece, which they did. I do lots of other things. It's an exhibition of my work in the UK. And it's called Willard's World of Wonder. And that's there in the UK for people to see. And... You know, I do a lot of online talking, and if people want to fly over, I will be there to meet them. It'll be a pleasure to meet them. Um, and the bad news is, I'm getting better. <laughs> <laughs> but that's definitely not bad news. I mean, that's good news. And the thing is, um, I'm, if any school teachers out there, this is what I'm going to to say to them. Not all school teachers are bad. No, they're not. School teachers are there to help to, to, to make to ensure that we, we we become successful in life. That you're here to teach us. Because without education, education is the key to success. It helps the world go around education. So I do not have any problem. Not all teachers are bad. I know that I would never ever make an assumption to say just because three or four teachers are bad to me, they're not all bad to me. But this is what I did. I showed them what came from nothing. Because when we were born, we were this microscopic this embryo, and then we grew. So there's a saying, Less is more, and in my case, that's exactly what happened. And there's another saying, little things mean a lot. Less things come in all packages. And that's what I believe. And my work is going to continue. I'm going to continue to do it. Even though it drives me mad, I'm going to continue. And... I haven't stopped doing it. I'm going to continue doing it. And as long as it brings some pleasure to people, then that gives me pleasure. But there is something, one person I need to do, which I'm working on, I'm going to carve out to the grain of sand, Abraham Lincoln. Wow. Because 
I like his bone structure. I like how he looks. Yeah, he's got a very oh, definite yeah. bone structure for sure. Yeah, he's got a sort of... Yeah, the, the pointy cheeks. You know. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Face and I, yeah, I, I'm going to do that. That's what I'm going to do. Mm-hmm. Well, we are running out of time. I would love to continue talking with you, but I definitely got to be able to uh, uh, do it within the time frame that I'm given on the station. So please tell everybody how they can get in touch with you and see your work. And, and do you have anything here in the United States coming out that they can go see it in person? Well, the thing is, I would like to come over and do it. If anybody wants to invite me over, I'm coming. <laughs> I'll, come on, I'll, I'll come over to the UK. I'm sure that they've relaxed all these COVID rules have been relaxed. I'm sure that people can still come. If you're ready to come and see me, I'm ready to greet, meet and greet you. You come over. But it's down, It's a small world, you know. It is. It really is. So you can come and start that the world is like way in the universe. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I can hear you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, I thought I couldn't. Yeah, you know, we're not in the universe, are we? The world is quite small in comparison to the universe. Just get on a plane and fly around. Yeah. And you can see me. That's so cool. And it's a little bit dark. Yeah. But you can still see me. You can still see me, so. I can see you, yeah. Well, I just wanted to thank you for coming on here and being a part of my show here. I got like less than a minute left, so I will definitely be able to uh, tell everybody, go to the website, www.wildwagon.mbe. That's all, MBE, yes. Member of the British Empire. Dot com. And guys, you're going to love his work. I'm going to I'm gonna promote it too on my Facebook and my Instagram. You're going to love his stuff, and I definitely want you guys to check it out. Well, another thing as well, I, I was honored. I had a doctorate from Warwick University. I'm now Dr. Lloyd Wigan MBE. When I was when I was invited to go to the university, I was honored with a doctorate, and I felt like the scarecrow in the Wizard of Oz. I was given a brain. <laughs> you know, so no, no, I'm, I'm Dr. Lloyd Wigan MBE. So I'm the story. I have so much to say, but I know time, you know, is limited in trying to get everything out, but. I hope I've delivered enough for people to be inspired by or they can get a picture or an idea of who I am. And I hope, you know, I've brought a lot of um, inspiration to, to, to the listeners and I've enjoyed talking to you, Emma. Thank you so much. I know I, I, I ranted on to you, so I didn't sort of give you time to ask me any questions, but I think I've given a brief introduction to who I am and a story of my life. I hope it it, it, uh, it resonates in people's minds. Thank you so much, Emma. You're welcome. And this is what this show is about, a story, so I know it's going to inspire people. I'm going to spread your work around. I want people to check you out, and I want them to be inspired as well. So thank you for coming on and being a great guest. Thank you. God bless. You too. God bless. All right, guys, you got to close out the show, but we will be back again next week with so much more. I know you guys are going to enjoy it. Stay tuned. OMG, you were on TV and junk.